loved by J.K. Chesterton, J.R.R. R. Tolkien and Evelyn Waugh, the Catholic Herald magazine has been a bold and influential voice in the church since 1888, standing up for traditional Catholic culture and values. Subscribe today for print and digital access by visiting our website at www.catholicherald.co.uk. Welcome to Merely Catholic with me, Gavin Ashenden. It was George Bernard Shaw who said that England and America are two countries separated by a common language. What we have in common and what separates us goes further, however, than just a language. The Daily Wire is an American news website and media company that exercises a role in public commentary on behalf of the center and the right of the political and philosophical spectrum in America that is undreamt of in the UK. Founded about nine years ago, the Daily Wire's annual revenue now exceeds over $100 million, has 150 employees. The more prominent voices like Ben Shapiro and Matt Walsh, who famously produced a documentary exploring what a woman was, have become household names for many. And, as we will discover, it is employing a surprising number of Catholics. One of them is Michael Knowles. Michael's a practising Catholic who attends the Latin Mass, and this, of course, places him at a certain point on the spectrum of the ideological and cultural and theological wars upon which the future of the West may be thought to depend. I asked him for a conversation about the role of the Daily Wire and the growing influence of Catholicism within it, and for his take on the immediate future, both of the USA, the West and the Catholic Church. And he joins me now. Michael Knowles, I've been a fan from some way off, and it's very nice to meet you in person. Uh, the Daily Wire is an extraordinary platform. You've been involved in it for about eight years, I think. Um, can you begin by, first of all, telling us, for those people who on the wrong side of the Atlantic or, or the other side of the Atlantic, who don't follow it, exactly what it does, because it's, uh, it's I was going to say, it's tempting to say slightly unique or very unique or quite unique. One can't ever use an adjective, but but it has a uniqueness all of its own. And then I'm going to ask you a bit about your own journey into the Catholic faith or back to the Catholic faith. But can you begin by telling us, for those who don't know it, what the Daily Wire is? Certainly. And thank you so much for having me. It's a great honor to be here, you know, on the Catholic Herald. I just moved my collection of Father Brown stories off of my desk but uh, I'm obviously a longtime fan, not only of the Herald, but of the many illustrious writers that have written for it. The Daily Wire does not have quite so long a history as the Catholic Herald. Um, it began in Southern California about nine or 10 years ago now. Um, I'm, I'm in the strange position of having been friends with all of the people who started it before it existed. And so in those days, we were all working alternately in politics and show business. I, I had worked in both. To my great uh, shame, I was once a professional actor in my wayward youth in uh, plays in New York and films and TV and things like that. And uh, I also have been involved in politics at a professional level uh, since I was a teenager. So I was doing, doing a bit of both those things. The, the founder of The Daily Wire, Jeremy Boring, uh, was a film producer, film director, who also was running the super secret conservative showbiz group in Hollywood. So secret it had a Wikipedia page called uh, Friends of <laughs> Abe, as in Abraham Lincoln. Uh, another one of the founding talent, Ben Shapiro, uh, though he never worked in politics at the campaign level or show business, you know, directly. He was quite well known even 10 years ago. And he wrote a book about Hollywood, exposing a lot of the left-wing bias there. Um, and uh, he was he was pals with Jeremy and I guess really all of us in the FOA group. Andrew Clavin was another founding talent. He uh, actually is a, a very successful Hollywood screenwriter and a novelist. I think Drew is about 155 years old. So he, he was there, you know, even before Hollywood existed. Um, when they asked me to join very, very early on, I, I had the thought, that uh, one does not move to Hollywood to get a real job. You know, I, I sort of actually resisted the suggestion. And I thought, here's just another right wing website. It'll probably disappear in six months. Uh, and my friend Jeremy said, Michael, 
don't be an idiot. You know, let me give you health insurance and you can help us launch this thing. I said, okay, why not? Uh, and then within 14 months, it became profitable. That was shocking to us. And within about, I don't know, three or four years, it, it became the biggest new media company on the right. And now as traditional broadcast has declined, I, I don't know, I, I I suppose it would be one of the, the biggest institutions on the American right. Uh, a great surprise to all of us who were involved. Um, but I suppose pertinent to our conversation, one thing that has made the uh, Daily Wire unique, certainly has distinguished it from other right-wing groups in America, is that it would seem that we represent all the different strains of American conservatism. Uh, you could get a hundred conservatives into a room. They would all find the one thing they disagree on. There are the traditionalists, the libertarians, the neoconservatives. I, I once heard the obscure political monikers described as the right-wing version of gender pronouns. And so at the Daily Wire, we have uh, Jeremy is much more libertarian, um, has a touch of the Bush era neoconservatism, perhaps. Um, ben was very libertarian for a lot of his uh, public life, though he's kind of uh, changed that a little bit. Uh, Andrew Clavin, much more focused on culture. I come from a, a much more traditionalist and Catholic strain of conservatism. Uh, Matt Walsh comes from the sledgehammer school of conservatism, where you just absolutely wallop your opponents on the head. Um, so I think that, in a way, made the Daily Wire uh, much more durable than some of the other outlets that crop up. Because, uh, well, you know, if you marry yourself to the spirit of the age, you'll find yourself a widow in the next. And this is good advice, not only for the church, but for politics, um, because political moments come and go every, I don't know, five years or so. Um, so it, it, it launched. We're now in our ninth or tenth year, uh, which is an eternity in political media. Who knows if we scheduled this interview next year? Who knows if it would even exist anymore? Um, but but it's been a, a marvelous ride. And Part of the reason that I think it has been able to grow so quickly is not only for the reasons I've just mentioned, the diversity of opinion, the uh, embrace of more novel uh, media strategies, but, but also that the, the Daily Wire did not merely want to comment on culture. We wanted to create culture. So we wanted to make feature films. We wanted to get laws changed. We wanted to uh, lead political movements, and we've done all those things. We during COVID, we sued the Biden administration to to stop the the private employer mandate for the vaccines. We uh, launched with Matt Walsh the What Is a Woman movie that that helped bring the uh, confusion over what a man and a woman are to to public for. It tells you a lot about our, our present uh, political confusion. Um, and, you know, we've launched a film studio. We launched a children's company. We've recently launched a, a razor company to take on a woke razor company, a chocolate company to take on Hershey. We call ours she, her, Jeremy's chocolates, you know, she, her, and he, him. <laughs> One of them has nuts, but I won't be so vulgar as to tell you which. And, uh, and a cigar company called Mayflower Cigars, which is mine. So uh, that's been a lot of fun. And uh, we've been running 300 miles an hour since 2014. And uh, we'll see at a certain point, you know, maybe we'll trip. But uh, in the meantime, it's been a great deal of fun. I think it's quite extraordinary. People on our side of the Atlantic will be absolutely bemused at this, partly because we have the paradox, whereas, whereas you have a separation of, of church and state um, and, and we have an, uh, an infusion of church and state. And our infusion has left us completely politically paralyzed. So that the, the thought of people doing, setting out to do what you've done, let, forgetting just the uh, the right wing platform, that's difficult enough in itself. But to add to it a a, a, a zeal for campaigning laws and creating culture, it's a, it's a form of am, am, ambitious expansionism that just doesn't exist over here. I'm I'm sorry to say, one of the things I've been really interested in, particularly watching Ben Shapiro uh, manage some of the issues that come to him, is the way in which there's a degree of religious homogeneity that you don't see in other areas. You would think that an Orthodox Jew dealing with Catholics, I guess there's some evangelicals in the mix somewhere in the company, but the, the, the capacity to take, uh, if you like, a monotheistic cultural norm and, and, and commit to it with sufficient insight and flexibility, not only is it a very mature 
balancing act to, to, to pull off. But it's obviously very productive. Has this, this, has this been worked out through a lot of hard negotiation behind, behind doors? Or is it simply uh, almost, if you like, a natural re-emergence of, of, of monotheistic um, siblingship in the face of a, of a vandal counterculture? There's been a lot of laughing and there's been a lot of yelling, but there have not been any hard negotiations, which I, I think is helpful. The, uh, you point out that we've got our founding talent as an Orthodox Jew. Then we have uh, Andrew Clavin, who no one even knows exactly what version of Christianity he is. It would probably be uh, Anglo-Catholic or you know some kind of high church Anglicanism. With, a, with an infusion of some evangelical beliefs as well. And then I'm Catholic. Uh, Matt is Catholic, though some people, uh, he, the way he talks, he, he uh, sometimes talks like an evangelical too. So he gets a yes, he does. Over there. That's right. He does. Yes. But sometimes people aren't, aren't quite sure. Um, occasionally people will ask me, Michael, how difficult is it to work for an Orthodox Jew? And I say, well, I, I actually don't work for an Orthodox Jew because Ben doesn't really manage the company. If he did, I would have been thrown out the window quite a long time ago. Uh, I, I said, it's much harder. The situation that I have, I, I don't have to work for a Jew. I have to work for Protestants. You know, the, the company was uh, founded by uh, three Protestants who have all sorts of uh, diverse and eccentric views. And so you've got uh, among the owners, mostly Protestants, one Jew, and they only ever seem to hire Catholics, which is a very strange turn of events. On top of that, a lot of the employees, talent, you know, on-screen talent, and also a lot of people who are behind the scenes running the business have converted to Catholicism over the course of the company. So and this is very interesting. Like I'd like to pitch an idea at you. I mean, I didn't want to, to stop you, but, but this plays into something that uh, um, I think is very exciting and very stimulating, and I'd like to test it out. Uh, so I'm, I'm a recent Catholic convert. Um, one of the conclusions I've come to as I, I look at history and try and interpret present circumstances, which are both shockingly clear and sometimes baffling as well, is that the only organisation, the only entity that has the, the capacity to bring some weight and muscle to bear on this cultural revolution is the Catholic Church. Uh, and that that if it fails or if, if, if a kind of an internal schism or takeover debilitates it we're we're in real trouble i'm very interested to hear you're, you're saying this this multi uh, this multi variegated religious organism you're part of is hiring catholics do you share my view i'm not asking you to share it as in please join my club i'm asking you to to uh, to, to test the hypothesis to destruction uh, what what's your view on the on the notion that that essentially one of the reasons for hiring catholics is that there's a a composite mental, philosophical, and spiritual um, homogeneity is not quite the right word, but but in integratedness that other spiritualities don't bring in quite the same way. This is not to say they're better or worse. Uh, it's simply to say that that Catholicism is the heart, soul, and mind of the West. It made the West. Is is there in the hiring of Catholics by this variegated? group of religious people a sense that actually that's where the muscle lies or is it just an accident and partly because Catholics are much more charming people than anybody else? I've always attributed it to the masochism of the owners of the company but I like your answer a little bit better and and there's quite a lot to it because I say this in no false modesty but in a spirit of true humility there are many question, questions to which I do not know the answer and I'm very grateful to be Catholic because when a question pops up, be it on the nature of the Trinity or the ideal regime or what I ought to have for breakfast on Tuesday morning, I can look in the Summa Theologiae and 99 times out of 100, I will get an answer, including about my breakfast. Uh, and when I don't find an answer in the Summa Theologiae on that rare occasion, I will have recourse to many other doctors of the church, fathers of the church, to the whole magisterium and deposit of faith. And uh, this is not possible for other uh, shades and sects of Christianity, and it's not, not really possible for other uh, religious traditions. Uh, I, I remember one time I was in some kind of argument with uh, Jeremy, uh, who is 
just the most delightfully curious. He takes the faith very seriously. He holds probably some of the most heretical opinions one could possibly imagine. And uh, he engages with, with all of them, you know. And, and so we were arguing about some point of doctrine or other, I don't know. And he was, he was angry with another colleague of ours. And he said, yes, I brought this up and you'll never believe what he told me. Uh, I said, well, what, what was the view that you were articulating? And he said, well, the view that, uh, you know, and I'm not saying I hold this view, but, but that the Old Testament uh, God is bad and the New Testament God is good and they're kind of distinct and this, that, and the other thing. And I said, oh yes, Marcionism. He said, that's what he said. You Catholics, you just, you have, you have an answer for everything. And you know, you don't ever think for yourself or, you know, and, and uh, it was very funny. I mean, he was obviously laughing a bit about it as well. Uh, I, I couldn't come up with, I couldn't come up with the Marcion heresy and I couldn't come up with the refutations of the Marcion heresy on the spot. Same goes for Albigensianism, same goes for all, all of the other ones. And, and so there, there is a systematic, uh, aspect to the Catholic faith and theology, which is becoming uh, more and more important. Uh, there, there have been periods in political history when uh, the, the Catholic, we, we can afford to push Catholic thought off to the side. This is not one of them. To use just one pressing political example, the rise of the surrogacy industry and in vitro fertilization, particularly coupled with the radical redefinition of marriage, uh, presents uh, grave problems for our political order. And uh, even even some of the best intentioned conservatives are coming up short to explain why these things are wrong. They might have an intuition of the wisdom of repugnance. They might, they might have a sense that these things are wrong, but they can't quite explain why. Well, happily, the church can explain why. And, uh, but, but this uh, requires going back through I don't know, perhaps Humanae Vitae, perhaps through Catholic social teaching, perhaps much further back than that to the perennial teachings of the church. Uh, Alexei de Tocqueville, who's probably the, the, the best observer of American politics ever, and he was making his, his observations in the uh, 19th century, uh, he, in a less quoted, less frequently quoted passage of Democracy in America, he said that Americans are very religious and it's a charming, wonderful thing, but their religion is a little bit incoherent. And so it's going to go one of two ways. Either America, which has such a Protestant um, aesthetic and uh, facade to it, uh, either they will follow their ideas to their logical conclusion and wind up Catholic, or they will follow some of their other ideas to their logical conclusion and give up religion altogether. And uh, the, you know, the, the swimming the Tiber that's going on at the Daily Wire, I think, is reflective of broader social trends in the Anglosphere and throughout the West. And it's a reminder of another quote by Hilaire Belloc, which is that I, I have to take it as a matter of faith that the church is divinely instituted. But for those who doubt the divine institution, uh, one proof of its divinity would, would be that uh, no other institution conducted with such knavish imbecility would have lasted yes, a fortnight. That's right. <laughs> yes. But Tocqueville was astonishingly prescient because, of course, that's exactly what's happening philosophically in the West. <clears throat> People, the, the, pro Protestantism, the spirit of the Reformation, the, 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 the endless relativism and, and, react, and, and, and personalized reaction against the faith has led through Protestant schismatic um, variegations to ultimately to the new atheists and then to, to, to no belief or as you quite rightly say to Catholicism one of the things that's happened here is that a number of people have managed to evade the cancer culture by, as as the as the journalists from the less move in and attempt to try and pin on them one of the folk one of the fake phobias uh, in order to denigrate them um, the answers come back. Well, don't, don't ask me about gay marriage. Ask, ask the church. I'm just a Catholic, yeah. so you know you need to take it higher. <laughs> and this has worked. This has worked extremely well for one or two eccentric Catholics in public life on the right here in this country. But the problem we have, and I, I'd like to ask you about this almost more than anything else, uh, is that whilst whilst both de Tocqueville uh, and Belloc and these politicians exercised quite a gravitational pull on me as I might, made my own way towards Catholicism. It was on the assumption that the magisterium wouldn't change, because that's what a magisterium is, 
and now I discover that that the, the Pope is has been uh, pushing the COVID vaccine, which was contingent upon research made on an aborted fetus, that the optics at any rate of gay blessing bleed into the possibility of homosexual marriage using therapeutic rather than theological or pneumatic criteria. And um, I'm one of those people who now says it's almost impossible to do evangelism as a Catholic, much as I'd like to, because 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 the magisterium isn't isn't holding the line anymore. What's your view of the civil war within the Catholic Church over the magisterium and uh, and the prospects for finding some form of solution that is less suicidal than what the rest of society has experienced? Right behind me, I have a little statue of Dante. And Dante also helps me to remember that we have challenging <laughs> pontificates from time to time. Yes, he places, uh, and, and even... he places many of the popes in, in, in fairly <laughs> noxious places. <laughs> he, poor Boniface VIII did not fare very well in Inferno. And uh, Boniface VIII also does not fare very well in Dante's work of political philosophy in, in monarchy. And uh, so to, to give a, a sense of the turbulent um, feelings of the moment throughout the history of the church that somehow gets smoothed out over time. Uh, in, in monarchy, Dante explicitly contradicts Boniface VIII's papal bull, Unum Sanctam, Unum Sanctam, which posits that the temporal authority is subservient to the papal authority. And he, he grounds this on the theory of the sun and the moon that the, the spiritual power is the sun and the temporal power is the moon and the moon has no power in itself. It only reflects the light of the sun. And Dante, uh, through a long Aristotelian syllogism, says, uh, this is bogus. He, he's clearly happier than ever that he put Boniface, poor Boniface, in, in hell. <laughs> and, uh, and immediately after Dante's death, this was probably the last work that Dante published uh, or, or that he wrote, uh, after his death, uh, there is some debate over this work, and uh, but again, we're talking about the early 14th century here. 200 years later, uh, in the 16th century, the work is placed on the index. So you have Dante, the divine poet, has his, his work of political philosophy thrown on the index, and it's prohibited for Catholics to read it. Uh, now, right around this time, you'll recall, there was a little something called the Protestant Revolution, and so one can understand why a challenge to papal authority might wind up on the index. Then fast forward 300 years, the book finds itself taken off of the index. Uh, this is in the 19th century. What's going on in the 19th century of the rise of political liberalism, a challenge even to the temporal authority and to the monarchy. And uh, so one can understand why it might fall off. And then fast forward to the pontificate of Benedict XV, uh, who says that in celebration of Dante, that this is a man who has perfectly throughout his entire life articulated the Catholic faith. What is one to do with that? Uh, I, you know, I suppose things are smoothed out over time and happily the Holy Spirit never departs from the church. But I'm sure in the moment, in the 13th and 14th centuries, this was unpleasant. And uh, for the 300 years that, Don, that the divine poet's work was on the, on the index, it was probably a bit unpleasant. And so hypothetically speaking, if a pope were to come out and contradict two millennia of church teaching on the uh, legitimacy of capital punishment. I'm just, you know, pulling, pulling a, just a hypothetical an idea from, from absolutely nowhere. Yes, yes. absolutely. <laughs> Shooting the breeze philosophically. <laughs> Should that happen? Yes. <laughs> uh, this would be something that uh, really could not happen. You know, um, uh, I attend the traditional Latin mass. I uh, am. Uh, quite a fan. My confirmation name is Thomas. I'm quite a fan of the scholastics and uh, the wonderful traditions of the church. Uh, so I'm, I'm troubled by some of the confusions that have been brought about by modernity. And yet, uh, the church is the, the only institution that has made it. It's the only one that has survived uh, from antiquity. It is, as you say, the institution that has shaped and animated our entire civilization. And uh, to, to uh, quote Alexander Pope, all nature is but art unknown to thee, all chance direction which thou canst not see. You know, uh, nothing will happen outside of the scope of providence, and which might, in uh, God's passive will, feel very unpleasant 
at the time, but our Lord promises us that he will never leave the church. And so uh, when when a pontificate makes one uh, reach for one's hair to pull it out and start screaming, um, we uh, kiss it up to God and we remember that suffering is indeed sanctifying. <laughs> that's, that's very helpful. And, and it fits in with a, a, an image that I've been trying to help some of my, my friends with as they've been dealing with this, which I, I had a sense that... that the magisterium is a bit like a meandering stream which which as it makes its way to the sea moves left and then right and then left and then right but always always closer to the sea and if you concentrate on its lateral movement it would freak you out a bit but if you concentrate on its getting to its destination it's it's less less worrying i i, I think one of the reasons for worrying is that we seem to live in a time of of, of ideological intensity which I guess has been brought about by social media and the internet. I mean, in previous generations, some of these ideas would have taken longer to percolate through. You would have had to build coffee houses and have some bourgeois people with time on their hands to, to, to chat about it. And, you know, through, through the length of time that these things would take, there'd be a, maybe less frenetic and less extreme. But we've condensed communication down into such sort of an immediate hit that's really quite difficult to take that longer perspective. Um, so do you think it's just a matter of not panicking and that, that, that inevitably there's going to be a great deal of, 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 of rolling around the loss of, loss of balance? It, it, but nonetheless, uh, so long as we, we avoid the, the, the self-inflicted apocalypse, things will come right in the end, the thin poke, fat poke kind of thing. <laughs> I, I think so, though I don't want this to lead us to a kind of political or ecclesiastical quietism. There's an irony that, uh, that after the Second Vatican Council, we heard cl- calls for more active participation of the laity in the liturgy and the affairs of the church. And yet, whenever uh, we actively participate in ways that contradict the <laughs> desires of a uh, 1970s generation that is enamored of novelty and relativism, uh, then then we see a, a quick return of clericalism. Then we see the the laity have to sit down and be quiet and you know do do as they're told. Um, so so we ought to uh, you know keep calm and carry on. To borrow a phrase from from your neck of the woods, uh, one example of this might be that. Uh, I mentioned the traditional Latin mass earlier, and there was a troubling um, motu proprio that came out recently, the uh, Tradiciones Custodes, which seemed... I think I've heard of it. Yeah, you may may have, it might have come across your desk. Uh, It (laughs) seemed to express a hostility toward the mass of the ages, which was almost entirely in place by the time of Gregory the Great and shaped... uh, virtually all of the saints in the history of the church and and to which many people still have a great deal of affection and which also happens to bring a lot of young people back into the church and many converts and reverts are drawn to it and i could go on and on talking about the the beauty and uh, virtues of the traditional mass that said um who am i to question things i'm merely a lay person uh but we do have canon law and we do have uh the magisterium. And we do have lots of bishops who are princes of the church. And we do have uh, certain uh, orders that are devoted to the traditional Latin mass. And we do. And we have a way of preserving uh, things. So uh, I think a lot of people's reaction to Traditionis Custodes was to yell and scream and pull their hair out. Uh, But my friends, and uh, the the real the trad the trad trads you know that I know they they did not because we we do recognize that uh, within providence all will unfold as it ought to and we we uh, simply cooperate with God's grace and we try to do the right thing and we try to do good and avoid evil and uh, in my experience many of us have been able to continue to worship in a way that we consider reverent and in keeping with two millennia of church history and. Uh, frankly, if you asked me on the future of the liturgy, I would say that it's quite clear at this point that the future of the liturgy will be the traditional Latin mass or yeah. something very close yeah. to it. I think that the the sappy 
hymns of the 1970s, which weren't even cool back 50 years ago, uh, they don't have a lot of staying power, and Gregorian chant certainly does. I'm sure that's true. I'd like to uh, consult your political antennae precisely about bishops, and so we, we ought indeed to speak of them with respect and affection, particularly given the responsibilities they have. On our side of the, the water, we have a particularly uh, unusual historical precedent, so that one of the reasons why Catholic bishops and indeed Catholic laity have been fairly quiet is because the establishment has been so universally uh, Anglican and, and set against the Catholic Church with punitive laws until fairly recently, a century or so ago. But behind all that, there's been a kind of snobbery of the establishment, which looked at Catholics as well, on the one hand, half a dozen ancient Aristos with lands, but mainly Italians, Poles, and uh, and other people whose whose hygiene and culinary habits were not quite <laughs> English, and so there was a <laughs> dreadful, dreadful sense of snobbery. And it seems to me uh, now now that I've converted and I've changed teams, always a dangerous thing to do. I want to encourage the Catholics in England and say you don't need to be affected by this snobbery. It's without any kind of virtue at all but everything else to Tocqueville style again has evaporated and if you don't take up the middle ground to recreate culture to challenge the bad laws nobody's going to do it and what's more it's your responsibility so I kind of I, I let the bishops off the hook to some extent because I think the weight of evolutionary culture over the last 50 years has been hard to bear and and to um <clears throat> Uh, and, and to suddenly say, well, actually, all those cathedrals, all those parish churches, all the paraphernalia of the Catholic architectural and sacramental mind that has that has uh, contoured our society, you know, the, we need to remarry again after this this temporary divorce. But that's going to take really quite a lot of of, of courage and um, and renewal. But in America, do you think that the reason that the bishops have been fairly quiet? by and large, in the face of the discomfort that some of the recent changes from the Vatican have produced, is, is precisely because um, if, they can, if they can see through the, the present temporality of this regime, then by avoiding being politically executed or marginalised or sent to the stocks or whatever the ecclesiastical equivalent of that happens to be, there's a job to be done when the atmosphere changes. It, do you think it's do you think it's actually a virtue that the bishops are holding their peace because they sense that the tide will change and they want to be there when it does, or or are they do they like so many other people feel demoralised, unsupported, uh, bearing bearing burdens of institutional responsibility, given the child abuse and, and other problematic phenomena that are really quite difficult to, to work their way through. How do you understand the present sense of passivity? Is it as an enforced quietism that's, that's sensible and brave or as, as people who have the stuffing knocked out of them? Well, you'd have to ask me bishop by bishop, I suppose, which probably would be impolite to do, but I think it's a mixed bag because we're, we're called to be wise as serpents and innocent as doves, and I think some of the bishops have done that. And I think there's a, a quite a bit of evidence that they've done that, that they have uh, protected uh, the faithful in and uh, the uh, tradition of, of the church and the magisterium uh, in a quiet way that doesn't attract a lot of publicity, but actually that's one of the strengths of it. And there have been some who have behaved in a cowardly way. Uh, some years ago, I, I published a fake book called Reasons to Vote for Democrats, A Comprehensive Guide, <laughs> <Yeah>. and it had <laughs> totally blank about pages. That. Superb bestseller, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, so probably my magnum opus. It's hard, hard to outdo it. Uh, so I, I gave a copy to a priest friend of mine, and he said, Michael, this is a great idea, and I think I'm going to do my own version, and I'll call it The Wisdom of the U.S. Council of Catholic Bishops, A Comprehensive Superb. Guide. And, and uh Though I'm I'm somewhat uh, hopeful, it, not only because it's a theological virtue and a demand, but but also by the way that the the bishops have reacted recently. Um, there on on Twitter, the USCCB published some 
question about, uh, I think it may have been about the liturgy. And I noticed a, a lot of people made fun of the felt banners that became ubiquitous uh, after the reforms following Vatican II. And uh, I, the USCCB account itself responded and said, nobody liked the felt banners. <laughs> you know, they're gone. <laughs> so it was kind of an admission. And, and you, you see this. I, I harp on the liturgy so much, not only because uh, Lex Arandi, Lex Credendi, but, but also because it's, it's so visual. You know, it, it, uh, one really has a picture of it. And uh, what, when I was growing up, it was all these sappy 1970s hymns that were just uh, I, I don't know how women could sing them. Certainly no men could, could really sing them with a straight face. And it was all just sentimental uh, piffle. But, but now you see the reintroduction of chanting, of some sturdy hymns, of Latin, of Greek, of ad orientem, uh, celebration of the mass in some cases. And, and that's not just coming out of the fraternity of the, the priestly fraternity of St. Peter or the Institute of Christ the King. This is coming out of the diocese, and this is coming from bishops who might be considered somewhat moderate or even somewhat liberal. I, I was gratified to see the other day on uh, CBS Face the Nation, uh, Wilton Cardinal Gregory, uh, the cardinal in Washington, D.C., w- was asked about our supposedly Catholic president, Joe Biden, and his uh, flagrant and persistent denial of very important Catholic teachings. And Cardinal Gregory, who has a reputation as being a liberal prelate, came out and he said uh, that the president might be sincere in his faith, but he's a cafeteria Catholic who picks and chooses what he wants to believe in and ignores the challenging teachings. And I thought, you know, good for you. Your Eminence, that's that's, yeah. that's wonderful yes. to see. Yes, for and, and it was quite severe. Exactly, and a lot of uh, because America is a little blunter in our use of language. There were many conservatives who thought that he was being uh, timid and restrained, and I thought, no, that, you know that cafeteria Catholic, that them's fighting words, and and this is uh, the cardinal <laughs> speaking about the president of the United yeah. States, and and uh, so. Uh, I I greatly appreciated that. There was a, an Episcopalian priestess or bishopress or something on, on the panel who immediately came to the president's defense and uh, misquoted, say, Thomas Aquinas. And, you know, she was the only one on TV, have, you know, who was making the veins in my neck bulge. Uh, but but f- even for a, a liberal prelate, he was not. He was He was defending the faith in a way, probably, that he felt was prudent and tactful. Uh, but nevertheless clear. And, and uh, so if, if uh, it's not merely the um, prominent right-wing bishops who are doing this, but even some of the liberal ones, I think uh, you're seeing a little bit of a sea change. And, you know, the church measures time not in days and weeks, but in centuries. And I think the confusion of the cultural revolutions is finally being corrected. 50 years too late for some people, but but better late than never. I'd like to try another couple of ideas on you since, since um, as you say, your, your crossover years between an, an actor and a politician, you, uh, you did a lot of Machiavelli. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's right. So you, you've come particularly well informed to the present debate. <laughs> um, it, 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 those of us in Europe look at what's happening in terms of the enormous immigration. You've also got mass immigration with, with the lack on the southern border um, of a different proportion. But it, but many of us are saying that we see, if you like, we're, 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 fighting, we're fighting Marx, if we can make Marx responsible for cultural Marxism and progressive leftism. And, and we're losing very badly and we're having freedom of speech taken away with, from us by, by use of all the phobia words and public censorship has now reached levels that one wouldn't have thought possible. But that about 10 years later, Islam will begin to flex its muscles simply because of the, the numbers that are there. And, and this isn't mere hysteria. This spring, for example, saw another example of the endless round of minute, annoying cancellations of Christian culture, Easter eggs, hot cross buns, uh, but, but for the first time, some very glamorous Ramadan lights in in Oxford Street, the centre, the centre of London's cultural life, and so, so those of us who see the, the balance of the fulcrum shifting, do so with a certain amount of evidence to back it up. Um, it's it's hard to know how the Catholic Church can 
defend Europe in the face of these two very powerful uh, opponents. The American situation is, as so often, is both the same and very different. Um, what do you see politically happening, and and what what is the relationship of the of the Christian faith and the Catholic Church to what you see politically happening as the next um, electoral earthquake approaches and um, the chasm between the two sides looks ever more threatening, violent, uh, and impossible to negotiate with any level of of, 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 of civility, let alone communication. It's no uh, secret that Catholic charities, the bishops, are largely behind facilitating mass migration into the United States. Uh, I, I take a charitable view, I think, of their intentions uh, in, in the same way that Chesterton might, which is uh, in Chesterton's observation that uh, heresy is often not the promotion of vice over virtue, but the promotion of one virtue to the exclusion of all the other virtues, <laughs> which, which uh, probably is what, what we're honest, seeing. Here. Often was. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, in, in this case, I, I suppose what I would ask the Catholic organizations and the prelates who are supportive of mass migration, I would ask them if uh, Charles Martel ought to have supported mass migration at the Battle of Poitiers, now called the Battle of Tours. Uh, should the Holy League have supported mass migration at Lepanto? Uh, Jan Sobieski, why, how closed-minded and narrow was he when he did not support mass migration at the Battle of Vienna? Uh, we're talking about, in the case of Europe, precisely the same people, uh, the, the only difference being that uh, now Europe is flinging open the gates. This is because of a, a grave misunderstanding of charity. And so the, the N-word crops up. In America, all, we're really not... A, and, and also a great misunderstanding of Islam, uh, but, but both right. together. Yes, correct, correct. Uh, you know, it's amazing that uh, the church has about a 1,400-year history uh, of conflict with Islam. And uh, perhaps it's not that we've forgotten what what Islam is. It's that we've forgotten, we've lost touch with our own faith and, and our own history. So, so that's, that's what's caused us to lose sense of it. And as a consequence of this, of losing courage and a sense of identity, you see the, the N-word pop up. In America, we have an N-word that you're not allowed to say. And I think actually the N-word in Europe is, is probably even more taboo. And that word would be nationalism. You, one is not allowed to mention the nation. And nationalism has a strange connection to the Catholic faith because modern nationalism is a consequence of the Treaty of Augsburg and the Peace of Westphalia, which is when the Catholics lost to the Protestants. So in many ways, modern nation states are, are a product of conceding the political order to Protestantism. And yet, there's a little something good in them in the sense that uh, love of country is is not only not wrong, it's a very good thing. It's, a, it's an extension of filial piety. It's quite disordered for you uh, to uh, oppose your own country. It's quite disordered to prefer someone else's country to your own country, just as it's quite disordered to prefer someone else's family to your own family. Uh, we, we are called to love and to charity, and there, are, uh, there is an order to charity. You know, I, I ought to love my children more than I love my neighbor down the street. I like him very much too, but I really have a responsibility for my children and they're very close to me. You know, um, a, 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 a political campaign that would uh, change the way that the left has framed this issue would be very helpful because we're told now that to care at all for your own country and your own history and your own borders and your own people is hateful. Uh, uh, hateful toward other people, but but of course it's not. It's a question of of love and and how love is best expressed, uh, especially in America, because there is a, a myth about our country, which has a lot of truth to it, but it is a myth nevertheless that America is the land of opportunity, totally open to everyone. You can show up here penniless and become a zillionaire, become an astronaut. Your kid could become president of the United States. Uh, Sure, that's true, but America was founded to be a shining city on a hill. Those are the words of Governor Winthrop, the Puritan governor of Massachusetts. Uh, this was supposed to be 
a model of Christian charity. And if the, the salt loses its savor, it's, it's good for nothing and, and ought to be trodden underfoot. Uh, if, if America concedes the, the, her strength, her vitality, what, her very identity, uh, then she's good for nothing, uh, good for nothing to us, the Americans. But even if your chief concern are the people who want to come here, good for nothing to them either. But she does look as though she's conceding to some extent, unless there's a form of of ideological renewal, not from the left. I hesitate to say it's from the right, because um, I, I've, I mean, you'll be much better at this than I am, but I've always thought that um, the, the right is not a thing in of itself, uh, any more than conserving is is an event of itself. But it's but it's more a rebuke or a resistance or a, a negotiation with the utopian aspiration of the left. Is there going to be some form of renewal of of vision, presumably Christian? What else is there to conserve um, from in, in America? I mean, and and what? And if I can add throw something else in, what's your view of the next election? Because rather like the next conclave, both the next American election and the next Vatican conclave are both going to have very serious consequences for what takes place in our civilization next. Well, in both cases, uh, the renewal will come about in large part because of a re-embrace of the Catholic faith. Uh, and if we don't do that, then there won't be any renewal. It seems uh, yeah. silly that one would have to say that when it comes to the conclave, but I think probably we do, <laughs> actually. And we have to say it when it comes to America as well, because while America is um, has, has long viewed herself as a, a Protestant nation, uh, it, it, that, that would not even be possible, by which I mean the, the civilization was Catholic uniformly for the first 1500 years. Then you have uh, 200 or so years where uh, there are kind of newer Protestant and then liberal ideas that crop up. Well, that's still a lot of time. I mean, you know, most of the formation, most of the ideas, most of the habits and attitudes and uh, behaviors that, that and institutions that crop up have that uh, Catholic DNA to them. Even if you look at the American form of government, now the left loves to call it a democracy, our sacred democracy. It's, it's not quite that. Actually, the, the best description, the nearest description I've seen to the American form of government comes from the Summa Theologiae. I don't think I'm, I'm uh, stretching too far to observe that when St. Thomas Aquinas is asked the ideal regime, he says, well, it's going to be a monarchy with a strong aristocratic element, with a, with a strong representation for the people as well. And in America, we have a monarchical element that's called the executive. We have an aristocratic element, which is not only seen in uh, the legislature, the U.S. Senate, but also in the original preservation of the rights of, of the states uh, to, to share in the federal power. And then obviously a representation for the people as well. That's Catholic. And whether it, that's because the framers of our constitution were reading St. Thomas Aquinas or because they were reading his ideas mediated through intervening philosophers, those are those are pretty Catholic ideas. And I think it is uh, noteworthy that the leaders of the American conservative movement, such as it has been for the last 70 years, have been disproportionately Catholic. I'm thinking, of course, of William F. Buckley Jr., who's largely credited with kicking the thing off. Russell Kirk, alternately considered the founder of the movement. Phyllis Schlafly, the most important woman in the movement ever. The list goes on and on. Uh, there are a lot of Catholics. And, and now today, the Catholic renewal in America, and I think in Europe and the UK, is largely Catholic. Because to your point, uh, the right does not really seem to have much existence in itself. You know, the term comes from the National Assembly during the French Revolution. The left are the people that are doing things, and the right, the monarchists and the Catholics, are saying, hey, please just don't chop our heads off. Thank you very much. We'd like to, you know, keep our property and our families. Uh, so that's not the most active kind of movement. Um, the, the new ideas that are cropping up, the non-liberal ideas that are that are returning in American public life, are coming from Catholic thinkers. I mean, even the term common good, 
uh, there are a number of s- supposed right wingers in America who shudder at that term because it sounds vaguely communist or socialist or something. But it, it need not be. It's a recognition that man is not an individual floating in outer space. That's a liberal idea, actually. Man is a social creature. Man is a political animal. And the family is the, the fundamental unit of society, not the individual. These are conservative ideas. The liberals are the ones trying to destroy the family. Often it's the, the conservatives who uh, acquiesce to that. Another great line from Chesterton, he says the liberals are the ones, the progressives are the ones who go about uh, messing things up and the conservatives are the ones who make sure they never get fixed. Well, that that <laughs> very accurately describes the situation in America. But uh, when when you come to the Catholic thinkers and politicians, it, it's there, there's not merely a reaction here. In fact, liberalism is a reaction against Catholicism. So there's something sure. a little sturdier. There are ideas and behaviors and practices that we can draw on. And, and uh, I, I, I don't want to be, uh, I, I don't want to seem like I'm evading the question here. I'm really not. But we also have recourse to prayer in the fullness of truth. Uh, we, we often turn to prayer as a last resort. I guess it's just human nature, but prayer really ought to be uh, a first resort and even at the moments in history, I just mentioned uh, the, the three biggies when it comes to Western history, Poitiers, Lepanto, and Vienna, uh, things looked very, very bleak. And then we pray our rosary, we, we, we kiss it up to God, and uh, things turn around. Uh, so if they do turn around, it'll, they'll turn around because we uh, re-embrace the, the faith that built our civilization. As Cardinal Manny points out, all political conflict ultimately is theological. Or if we just continue to, to uh, conserve the liberalism of 18 months ago, uh, then, well, what, what American right is there even to win? Michael, to bring us back to both the, the power of the rosary and the power of the mass is a great way to finish our conversation. So thank you. Thank you so much for, for uh, the tour de force that you've offered. Thank you for all the uh, political uh, and, and spiritual wisdom that you've brought to conversation too. It's been really wonderful to talk to you. And uh, I I hope very much that the Daily Wire doesn't burn itself out in a fit of over-creativity in the next year or two, but actually continues to fill the vacuum with with the wisdom of the Catholics that they go on hiring. Thank you very much for for taking the time. It's been great to talk to you. Thank you so much for having me. The pleasure has been all mine.